Order, members. Uh, the next item on the agenda is questions to the Minister for Communities, and I call Mr. Daniel McCrossan to ask the first question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question one, Minister. I thank the member for his question. Um, so, for the period of the 1st of April 2019 to the 31st of March 2020, there were 3,779 successful PIP appeals and 2,201 unsuccessful PIP appeals. Therefore, 63% of PIP appeals were successful in the years 19, 2019 to 2020. For the period of the 1st of April 2020 to the 31st, or the 31st of October 2020, there were 104 successful PIP appeals and 133 unsuccessful. Therefore, for the seven months up to the 31st of October, 44% of PIP appeals have been successful. As a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, no appeals were listed for hearings between the 18th of March 2020 and the 6th of July. 2020, and since then, a limited number of appeals have been listed for hearing. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister, for uh, the answer to that question. Uh, Minister, the significant rate of success of appeal makes the need for appeals to be heard as soon as possible, and certainly in a reasonable amount of time. Yet there is a backlog of over 4,000 people waiting for their appeals to be heard, a problem that has predated the, this pandemic. Minister, how many appeals does the Minister expect to be heard by the end of this year? Well, I, I agree with the member. There has been a backlog. Part of COVID, and certainly COVID hasn't helped at all. Um, so what I've asked officials to do is to try and expedite ways in which people can have their appeals heard. Um, many people aren't comfortable with the desktop uh, review um, and certainly looking for telephony. So it should be video calls, phone calls, and some have the opportunity for face-to-face. -face. But it's really, really important. Not only we get this backlog addressed pre-COVID, but certainly the backlog since. I suspect the figure that you've quoted has actually increased since that response was given. Before I call the next member, could I welcome Ms Nicola Brogan to her place and wish her all the best in the House. Ms Brogan. Thank you. Um, in relation to hearing types available to claimants making appeals, which is the one most favoured by appellants? I welcome, I welcome the member to the Assembly. Um, and I wish you all the very best. So the least favourite, as in response to Daniel McCrossan, also both you share the constituency, is probably the desktop. So we're looking at video calls and t telephone calls uh, to try and assist people because it is very stressful, a plan for this benefit. It is certainly even more stressful when you're appealing it, and we need to make sure that it's as smooth as possible and as stress-free as possible when they're, they're a plan for their, their PIP appeal. Ms Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you very much, Minister. I'm glad to hear that you're talking about um, an alternative to telephone as a means of communication. Um, video conference would be very much welcome for PIP assessments. Um, can I ask the Minister if whatever system that she's considering, um, will it be um, hearing compatible for those who have, with hearing impairments? Um, and also, can um, those people who are using this new type of system have someone with them because quite a lot of people have had mental health issues over the way that they've, they've had to go through assessments so far. I, com I completely agree with the member on all the points she's raised. Um, first of all, if people are doing video calls and have hearing impairments, they should absolutely under disability law, which is human rights, should be human rights compliant as strong as possible, have an interpreter there, indeed even for people um, who have difficulties communicating. Um, and the other aspect of it is we do need to make sure that, particularly as I said uh, in relation to Nicola's supplementary, that we need to make sure that this process is as stress-free as possible. So I'm looking at alternatives. I met with PPR last week, and it certainly was one of the issues that was on the human rights checklist that they're asking us to bring forward. Mr Andy Allen. Minister, can you advise how many of those unsuccessful appeals went on to stage two appeal to Social Security, Security Commissioner? And also, do you have any data on how many of those within the backlog of appeals are currently in receipt of welfare supplementary payments? And can you give a guarantee that none of those payments will be impacted whilst they wait for their appeal to be heard? Um, I thank the member for his three supplementary questions. <laughs> 
so fair play to you. Um, I don't have the answers to the first two questions. Uh, I'll certainly get the member the data that he's asked for. It's probably here somewhere, but it certainly didn't jump out at me, and I will get that response to you. Um, and uh, as a member will know, um, this, this, and I said to others, but it would be a worry even in his own constituency, it is very, very stressful going through this process. The last thing we need is not only for the, the, the stress to be increased, we don't need it to impact on other benefits as well, uh, and other entitlements. So we need to make sure that this is as smooth as possible. It sounds like an easy thing to do. It should be an easy thing to do. But the backlog is such that we need to tackle that head on and actually maybe use, if it's appropriate to say this, this opportunity to maybe do things a bit differently and make sure that there's better outcomes for people who are waiting on good decisions. Ms Rachel Woods. Well, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer so far. The Minister will be aware that people are much more, more likely to get a PIP award with support from another person or the independent advice sector. So I ask the minister, minister if she would support a list of independent advice sector organisations or advice lines being sent out with the PIP form and make available the overturn rate for mandatory reconsiderations in the information they send out as how best to challenge a decision so that more people can make an, more of an informed decision about whether or not to take the matter further. And I thank the member for her questions, and that's certainly one of the issues I'm considering as well. It keeps coming up time and time again from the independent advice sector. Actually, it keeps coming up from GPs as well, as social workers, family support workers, uh, and a whole range of people. Um, so I, I absolutely will be considering that. And as I said to uh, Kelly Armstrong, I think it actually would be more human rights compliant and more humane if that was allowed to happen as well. Mr. Jerry Carroll. I was <coughs> dealing with a case um, of a constituent who sadly um, passed away. They were waiting for a long time on a PIP appeal and a PIP decision. Uh, they got the award after they had passed away. Um, Mr. Are you or your department aware of how many people have tragically passed away from, uh, from COVID, COVID whilst waiting on a PIP appeal or a PIP decision to be made? Um, I'm really sorry to hear that, Jerry, and pass my sympathies and thoughts on to the family. I'm not aware, but certainly when I'm asking, for the data that Andy has raised, I'll ask for that as well. The last thing that should happen is someone's grief be confounded by a letter, either successful or not successful, coming out after their loved one has passed. Mr. Philip McWigan. Deborah Daw, question number two. I thank the member for his question. Um, so, in short, uh, early next month is really when we hope to have these funds open and following a successful October monitoring round bid, I secured £15 million and I'm sure the member heard that I successfully uh, achieved another £10 million on top of that. And the aim of these funds is to ensure the sports sector, which is representative of so many diverse range of interests right across our community, not only is sustained during the ongoing period of COVID, but also actually, you know, is supported. So officials, my officials in sport and I are currently working on development programmes that will deliver a needs-based scheme to ensure that the funding is distributed fairly with full transparency and for those who can evidence the financial loss has been incurred as a result of restrictions. I have met with a lot of representatives from government bodies. I have spoken to a lot of clubs and I am well aware of the financial impact that these interventions have had, that COVID interventions have had on the sports sector, and it is my intention to launch the fund as soon as possible. Mr. McQuiggan. Oh, good. Uh, I thank the Minister for her response. Uh, I obviously welcome the news that the, the sports fund will be open early next week. I welcome the, this financial package that the Minister has agreed with the, the, the sporting bodies and for her continued engagement with sport governing bodies across the north, indeed for her engagement with local GAA clubs in my own constituency uh, recently. Uh, can I ask the Minister, uh, given that she said that the money would be distributed fairly, that uh, maybe she could provide assurances that the money she has allocated will uh, be accessible to grassroots sporting clubs? Uh, so I thank the member for supplementary question. Just for clarity, he said early next week. I said early next month. So, <laughs> so you're okay. I just want to, you know, I just I could see people's um, body language going there. So just chill your jets. Give me a couple of weeks. Anyway, yes, absolutely. I think it's really important. Not only the government body support it, and of which there are many, but the, certainly the grassroots. I mean, grassroots right across all the sports have been part of the first response during this pandemic. 
um, and literally have been, and it still are, playing the role of lifelines to people, even though it's not their primary function. And they have lost money as a result of the restrictions that we have placed on them, and actually incurring a lot of money. And as we all know, within the charitable and volunteering sector, that the ability to raise money through these months has been greatly hindered. So grassroots, and that's why I said fairly, grassroots are well uh, entitled to expect some share of this funding. Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I welcome this much-needed financial aid for sports. Uh, can I ask the, the Minister um, when we might be able to expect a restart of uh, grassroots youth sport and whether she would be open to reviewing which sport can be included in the elite category? Well, um, first of all, um, I'm very conscious that a lot of particularly young people have been prevented from getting involved in sports and training um, as a result of COVID restrictions. Um, I have no plans to review what's in the Lily category if the member has certain specifics, because uh, some, some of the correspondence I've received, people asking for their sports to be categorised as elite won't, won't fit the criteria, but that's not to say maybe the one that you had in mind won't either, or perhaps maybe. Um, and as a member will be aware, um, I'm working around the current health and scientific advice on these restrictions. Uh, and to say that I have confidence when I spoke to the governing bodies, but particularly the clubs and the measures they are taking, and I am really keen to get the, the, the youngsters and maybe people like myself, the certainly not so young, uh, back out again to get a bit of training done. Mr Jonathan Buckley. Deputy Speaker, and I know the Minister will understand the critical nature to get that funding out to sports clubs as soon as possible, and I welcome the announcement that that's going to happen at the end of the month or start of next. Um, but in relation to, we, we know that COVID relief funding will not be enough to sustain a lot of clubs going forward, given the serious pressures that there is. And then with that in mind, could the Minister maybe give an update as to the progress of the sub-regional sub sports stadium funding and the need to ensure a regional balance to that funding? Well, there will be a regional balance to that funding. Um, I'm aware that if you listen to some of the clubs in Belfast alone, they'll have it all spent. So it's just to give the member that assurance. Um, certainly in terms of what the next stage are, we're currently working through the, the business cases and, and all the outstanding items that we need to get concluded before I bring it forward to the Department for Finance for approval and indeed to the rest of the executive as well. But it is really, really important that uh, people who live in the members' constituency uh, can expect to get some, some money. In relation to the Sports Hardship Fund, you may be aware that I, this, this afternoon, this morning, received an additional £10 million, so that's £25 million in total, which I'm sure the member will agree will go a long way to help clubs, particularly who are really struggling at this time. Ms Rachel Woods. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, question number three. Thank the member for her question. So I've had extensive engagement with Minister Murphy, uh, particularly on the future of social housing, and I welcome any changes to the construction of social housing if it results, and hopefully it will result in improvements to overall environmental standards. In the meantime, my officials are also continuing the engagement with DOE, DOF officials, and for example, um, our officials are also represented on the development of DFE's new, energy, on the DFE's new energy strategy and on DARA Future Generations Group on Climate Change. The primary responsibility, as a member will be aware, um, for introducing a requirement into building regulations for dwellings to be zero carbon rests with the Department of Finance Building Standards. However, we are working collectively to try and have these regulations uh, introduced uh, after a public consultation. Ms. Woods. Thank you, and I give you a, a promotion there, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I thank the Minister for her answer, but in, re in answer to a written question to my colleague Claire Bailey, the Minister of Finance indicated on the 30th of October that his department were still consulting on technical, technical documents relating to nearly zero energy requirements. So, and can I ask the Minister for her assessment on the potential of social housing being built without the relevant regulations and technical documents being in place from the Department of Finance? Well, certainly I've been uh, on the record as, as looking at new construction methods, so they will be looking at um, the best possible standards in terms of the environment. 
the, the documents that the Department for Finance are working through are quite um, technical. My understanding is not only the technical, but the volume of them um, is quite long as well. Uh, we want to do our best uh, to try and get to those as part of the consultation. So whatever changes there are needed in built and control regulations, that will be done as soon as possible. But I, just to give the member assurance, I will be asking my officials, the officials in the Housing Executive and indeed housing associations, delay as closely and keep an eye out to the best possible standards. Because what we don't need is new houses being built that have to be almost retrofitted a few years later. That's a waste of public money and people's patience. Ms Linda Dillon. Thank you to the Minister for your answers thus far. Minister, can you give us some detail on what difference it will make to the amount of grant that the Housing Association will get if they are able to achieve zero care? So, in relation to that question, I would imagine that it will be part of the total cost indicator that the Housing Associations and indeed Housing Excited, when they get to build, uh, will receive. I, I just double check on that. Um, but certainly, if there is any increase in construction costs, as there may be, um, as a result of um, any improvements in built-in regulations, then I would imagine that goes into the total cost indicator, but I'll check it and get back to the member in writing. Mr Mark Durkin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Principal. Deputy Speaker, thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Uh, has the Minister made an assessment on the adequacy of the housing fitness standard in providing high-quality, environmentally sustainable housing? I haven't made a final decision on it, just to let the member know through yourself, um, Principal Deputy Speaker. I haven't made any final decision on it, but I do believe that in relation to the question that Rachel Woods asked, so you're almost making or signing off on a, a fitness standard that is actually old and it's not fit for 21st century. And as part of looking at these regulations, we'll be looking at the fitness standards, not just for the public sector, but also for the private sector as well. Ms. Paula Bradley. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her questions. And I thank uh, Rachel Woods for putting this question down. I absolutely agree with her sentiments on this. But, Minister, we have many, many homes within the social housing sector right now that are not fit for purpose, that have damp, that have poor heating, that have no cavity wall insulation, and the, 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 the carbon footprint in them, on those houses is through, through the roof. So, is there anything to be done on our homes we have at the moment? Well, I, the member will not be, not be shocked if I say there's at least 40,000 homes that are in need of serious repair. And I would consider uh, being, able, being able to live in a home without developing a respiratory disease is just something that should be a basic ask. Um, and that's part of the reason why I brought the statement forward uh, in the reconfiguration uh, to a mutual or cooperative for the landlord side of the housing executive. Uh, the member will also be aware from a previous days in DSD that the Savills report put in at least 7.1 billion I would imagine it's probably more towards 7.8 now. So the, the homes not only need to be safe, clean, warm and dry, they also need to have the, the proper models and materials and tools to ensure not only are we looking at reducing fuel poverty, but we're also looking at better health outcomes. And for many people, particularly in our constituency, the levels of respiratory disease is completely unacceptable. Ms. Gemma Dolan. Good pre can call you question four. Thank the member for her question. So on the 14th of August this year, my department approved the outline business case for the redevelopment of Enniskill Library on the existing site at Hall Lane in Enniskill. And while the project is at a very early stage, my department has already allocated one hundred and fifty thousand pounds in this financial year to Libraries NI to allow them to advance the project to the design and procurement phase. I can also confirm that a design team has now been appointed to progress the concept design, necessary feasibility studies and develop the design for the project. The construction of the new library has been projected to require an investment of £4.5 million and the estimated completion date of which is 2023. Ms Thank you, and I thank the Minister for that very welcome news. I'm sure we'll have some very happy people in Fermanagh. Um, could I invite the Minister to come and visit the library when it is safe to do so? Um, certainly. Uh, I have visited quite a few libraries in the members' constituency in my previous days in DECAL. Um, I'm personally delighted to see that this library is receiving the support it needs, because I can remember it from 2013, 2012, 2013. 
needing some support. So I am. Um, when the restrictions are lifted and when the time is appropriate, I'd be more than happy to visit the members' constituency and this library. Ms. Rosemary Barton. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. Minister, now that you're on the libraries in Fermanagh, South Tyrone, I'm going to ask you what the, what the update is on Fymel Town Library. Uh, I thank the member for a question. I actually don't have the information on that library, but I will get it for you and I'll write to you. Um, I should have anticipated every library, at least one library in everybody's constituency been asked, but that particular library wasn't on the list, so apologies for that. Mr Jerry Kelly. I thank the member for his question. I am currently considering a range of options to increase the supply of social housing to address demand. A key element of this plan will be to ring fence and wait the social housing development programme output so that it, it is better providing new social homes in greater numbers and areas of most need. My officials and the housing executive are currently progressing this work, and it is my intention to see the ambition of ring fencing uh, reflected in the new three year programme, which will be submitted to me in January 2021. Mr. Kelly. I go and bring this to the hand for you. I thank the minister for the answer up tonight. And my second part of the question, supplementary, you have to a great extent uh, answered it in terms of when we will see uh, the beginning of these changes, which were promised in the very welcome statement you made. But could the minister be aware of uh, damage done to a, a housing executive of our premises in our down, caused by faulty shower units? I would ask the Minister, is there an investigation going on here, and especially since uh, I understand these shower units were on a, a recall list uh, from 2018. So my worry is that in social housing uh, throughout the North, we may have a huge problem. Um, I thank the member for his question. I did see um, some media reports um, of this prompted by the member, I'm sure. But um, uh, it is very worrying that if it is the case that these shower units were recalled in 2018, that a, subsequently a fire has happened in a home. Um, so certainly I await the outcome on the, the initial investigation. And I'll also be asking, just to assure yourself, but indeed other members, were any other recalls happened in any other constituency and what has been done since? Because I think that's a fairly credible question to ask. And when I get that uh, advice, and if it does, Flag up concerns. I'll start with the members. Ms. Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers. Minister, um, North Belfast, as we know, is one of those areas that is to be ring fenced. Can I just ask you, when you're looking at that, um, you, you look at the entire North Belfast, because quite often Newton Abbey is left out of the social housing figures when it comes to demand in North Belfast. So, can you give me that assurance that Newton Abbey 1 will also be taken into account? Well, I thank the member for a question. I'm looking at the geographical area, um, but certainly I talk to the officials to ensure that's the case. There's need in all constituencies, and there's need within constituencies. And certainly, what I would anticipate is when the, reco when the not recommendations, but when the policy progress comes back, I'd be looking to see what uh, areas that covers. The issue for me is that, uh, as a member, will be aware that every year. Uh, levels of acute housing stress are grown by a thousand, and you know we're now sitting at an unacceptable levels right across, and it is right across the constituency. So I will definitely give the member the assurance. I wait and see what I'm presented with, and if it's not there, I'd certainly be asking. Mr. Mark Durkin. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, thank the, the minister again. Uh, so, Minister recognise the importance of enshrining flexibility in her new ring fen or reintroduction of this ring fencing policy, because when the policy did e exist before, it was demonstrated by the housing executive that it did not have sufficient flexibility, which impacted negatively on social house provision in, uh, inside and outside of uh, ring fenced areas. Well, I, I thank the member for his, his question, and he is absolutely right, because I remember at the time when the policy was removed and even the whole consultation around to it. I think what I would be expecting, so just let me be clear, what I would be expecting the housing executive to do, not only to present me with proposals that look at areas of most need and the member's constituency is at the top of that need, unfortunately for him and for everybody else too, and it has been persistently so, 
We need to look at ways in which we can tackle this. The one size fits all isn't going to work. So we do need to have, should there be flexibilities or even the ability to contract in and out because it needs to reflect the true need and it also needs to have an outcome for those people on the housing waiting list. Ms Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you very much, Minister. Minister, uh, when we have this ring fencing of new build social housing, it means then that the opportunities for builders has increased fantastically. Um, could I just ask, but there is an issue with the number of, of younger apprentices and younger people coming through into the industry. Are you working with the Department of Economy and Education to identify opportunities so that we can bring more people into the workforce? Well, certainly when these proposals come back, I will be talking to other departments. Um, but I also want to go further as well. I want to ensure that the way in which procurement happens isn't open to as much challenge as it is. So, for example, even current housing executives' contracts are challenged at a very, very low rate, which holds the whole uh, procurement piece and indeed contracts back. I want to make sure that it's done as part of any contract. So the social clauses, the social benefits, the social value needs to be built into the start and indeed the completion of the project not just for a couple of weeks here and there, that the apprentices are fully supported from the day and or the walk-in to the day and or the leave, hopefully with the trade. And hopefully the other opportunity, particularly in relation to Rachel Wood's question, in new ways of construction, because that is a new market, not just for you know, current tradespeople, but also for new and prospective tradespeople. Mr Andy Allen. Principal Deputy Speaker, Minister, in the last 10 years we have been in the round in meeting the target around new social housing starts. Um, but as we discussed the committee, quite clearly that isn't having the effect that is required in housing the many thousands of people across the province on the housing waiting list. As part of your revitalisation, I, I appreciate that that's uh, towards trying to increase the number of houses we're building. Are you able to indicate at this stage uh, what a more realistic and ambitious target of new housing starts will be? Well, the member may be aware that even through the programme for government negotiations, as before we, this place was um, brought back again, that I think every single party wanted the programme for government to have a housing indication and indeed within that better housing targets. So at the end of January, I'll have a proposal and I'll, date, I'll have a policy direction that I can look at. In turn, well, I've given a policy direction, but certainly proposals on tackling not just the ring fencing, but also increasing the levels of housing starts uh, and indeed houses as well. Uh, it has never ever, I think one year it met its target and the other years it hasn't. And like all other members, it's not acceptable. Mr Roy Beggs. Thank the member for his question. So, from my contact with people right across the arts and cultural sector, I understand the impact of the current restrictions and what they're having on their ability to make a living and indeed to continue to provide support to individuals and organisations. So, as a wider package of measures to support the culture, arts and heritage sectors, the Arts Council on my behalf and my department as well have delivered two rounds of funding to individuals working across the arts and creative sectors. The Artists Emergency Programme which was open for applications from the 27th of April to mid-May, with payments being made in May and June, as well as the Individual uh, Emergency Resilience Programme was open for applications from the 31st of July to 17th of August, and offers of grant were issued in October. And the two programmes have resulted in grants totaling £4,400,000, being made to over 13,000 individuals. Um, I will uh, very shortly be making an announcement on further programmes to support individuals, as it continues to be my attention uh, that this should be made available to a wide a range of possible right across the arts and creative sectors. Many uh, music and drama tutors operate from home, usually are self-employed, and have been unable to benefit from the furlough scheme. I'm aware of one highly successful local arts company who actually established themselves as a company to minimise their tax liability. They have had no income since February. So my question to the Minister, the new scheme that she is referring to, will it exclude, include those who have been excluded to date or will they have to rely on perhaps other schemes that the Finance Minister might bring out? Um, well, I think even just in terms of the businesses, so a lot of companies who may have came to the Arts Council previously got other support from 
you know, for example, the Department for Economy, and some got support from the Department of Finance, particularly around their rates and that. But the issue for me is that a lot of people who are self-employed haven't had access to any public funds, and that is a problem. So I would encourage the member to encourage companies like that and individuals like that to apply to the Arts Council because this is exactly the sort of support that we're trying to get out, particularly for people who have had no access to any public funds, may not be eligible for universal credit or anything else, and really in the, you know, the run-up to Christmas um, have been put under additional pressure not knowing where they're going to get support from. Thank you, members. That ends the period for list of questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. I call Mr. Morris Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Minister for... Uh, attending the chamber this, this afternoon. Uh, can I ask the Minister about funding for musical instruments, which is due to close today, and, and the Committee for Communities supported forwarding a letter asking for an extension. What guidance have you given to the Arts Council in relation to this? Well, I, I haven't seen the letter yet, but I'm certainly happy to look at it. Uh, and when I look at it, I make a decision whether to reissue guidance to the Arts Council or ask them could they extend it. As a member will also be aware, um, even the Ulster Scots Agency will have access for musical instruments, particularly for bands. And it's really important, particularly when people are self-isolating and trying to do tutorials over the internet, that they're given access to instruments to actually teach with. Mr. Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister why this funding was only open for 17 days, uh, which is given many, many bands have been unable to have meetings or practices or have any sort of uh, committee meeting to apply for this funding, uh, would it be open again for further applications? Um, just to give the member assurance, I wasn't aware it was only open for 17 days, so what I will uh, make a commitment to him, I'll go and find out exactly what the criteria was, how long it was opened, um, what notification the Arts Council give, um, and then if there's a need for an extension, I'll talk to the Arts Council about how that can happen. I don't want anybody to fall out of the, the, the loop here, particularly um, if it means to say that they can use their skills and their expertise to help others, particularly during COVID. Just a point of housekeeping. Topical question number five in the name of Mr Stuart Dixon has been withdrawn. I call Mr Paul Frew. Principal Speaker, can I ask, why, Minister, are you failing the most vulnerable in society when, you are, uh, when there are no appeals taking place for PIP or ESA and you expect people to fight those horrendous appeals through the phone? Alone, and why, Minister? Then, in the Kickstart programme, are we failing people too with, when we haven't commenced that programme also? Well, I'll take the member's last question first. So, first of all, it's not my intention to fail anybody. So, um, I just want the member to accept that. Um, well, I'm not. So, respectfully, I disagree. Um, so, the Kickstart isn't going to be introduced in this month. And I'll tell you why. We're not calling it kickstart. We're calling it job start, because it's far better than what uh, the English uh, government or the British government over in England introduced. It, it will be a, a bespoke programme. Uh, and as soon as I introduce it, it will be done at the same time as a two-week lockdown. And I don't want that to happen, because as soon as it's introduced, the clock starts ticking. In relation to, to PIP, if the member had been here, and I appreciate we'll have to do a skeleton order because of the restrictions, but the member will have heard me say, so I'll repeat again for him. I'm, I'm not happy with people just been given the opportunity to talk about their appeals over the phone. I want other avenues being made available to them. Um, oh, sorry, oh, on desktop, if it's by phone or video conferencing, that's what people have said that they most prefer. Um, so, and again, I do not accept that I'm deliberately failing anyone. If there's things that I could do better, I'm happy to look at those. Um, but I just... You know, we just ask the member to reconsider that. Mr. Frey. I assure the minister she is failing people when she cannot use two decent side rooms in Bellamina to have oral hearings for PIP and ESA. A laptop, a desktop minister just will not cut it when you have vulnerable people not able to speak, not able to address other people across the phone or a computer technology. You are failing, minister, in this regard. Well, I'll certainly go back and ask the officials what happened in the member's constituency. Uh, I can be, you know, rest assured that I will do everything I can to ensure people have a fair hearing. 
because that's what it's about. So if it needs whatever work didn't work and it's, it's actually caused people more stress, I'm not starting over that. And to be fair, and I'll say this, the officials in my department don't want it either, so something's not working. Now there is a massive backlog, but we need to try and fix it, and we need to fix it where people who are already going through a very stressful situation aren't put under additional stress, particularly given the fact that this benefit is for people who need it most. So that's my commitment. Mr. Pat Sheehan. Uh, I'll ask Kian Corla. Could, could I ask the Minister what measures uh, she's considering to increase capacity in the social housing development programme to better target areas of acute housing need? Well, the, the, so I thank the member for his question, um, and he will be aware of the statement that was made here some time ago. I mean, the, the need right across the north is actually growing, and it has been growing exponentially every year. But for people who are living in acute housing need or what's described as housing stress, it's actually completely unacceptable. So that's why I introduced ring fencing as one example, but there are many other ways in which we need to tackle this. I'm also in discussion, and I will be advancing discussions with our housing association colleagues, our housing executive, but also our local councils, to see what land we could develop collectively as part of the local development plans. Um, and then we need to get houses that are fit for the, the pur fit for purpose for the needs of people where they're at. Um, so they are some of the ways in which we're hoping to address the acute housing shortage. Mr. Sheen. Gordon, I've got a free last concord. August going break a session. Ara, I saw the flag. I thank the minister for that answer. And, and I wonder, could she tell us what areas have been identified as having the highest need? Gordon, I've got. Well, Mark Darkin's still here. So his the Foyle constituency has the highest need, then North Belfast and then West Belfast. So they have been persistently the areas that have had highest need. And I would talk about going back over decades. Um, so that's why those areas need not only to be ring fenced, but we need to have ambitious plans to reduce the stress that people are living in, as well as future proofing the future generations come behind. Because it's quite clear that even, you know, just not, not only even anecdotally, but evidentially, that those areas, because the supply isn't there to meet the demand and hasn't been, that we need to actually start lifting the curve on that. And the only way to do it is when you actually bring in uh, proposals that address that not only head on, but look for opportunities for land, particularly in those areas of housing need. And I believe that wasn't the case up until now. Mr Justin McNulty. Gurumayabich, Lashkan Khoi, can I thank the Minister for her answers thus far? Minister, you've already been allocated £15 million for sports hardship. The Minister for Finance has today announced a further £10 million um, for your departments. How exactly will that £25 million be spent? And when? Because sports clubs and organisations, they need money now, not, not in February or March. I, I agree with the, the, the member and I'm aware of a recent meeting with Sport NI where clubs were told or government bodies were told that they wouldn't be getting any money perhaps until the end of March. So it's, absolutely sent everybody off in a spin. Um, so my intention is that certainly early next month that those applications will be opened. Um, I also welcome the additional £10 million that Conor Murphy gave uh, because it's quite clear that even the governing bodies themselves could have spent that 15 or 30 for getting down to the grassroots clubs. And we need to make sure that the money addresses the losses that people have now and that goes from a big government body right down to a small grassroots club with a handful of people. It's important that they all get some money. Mr McNulty. Minister, I've been contacted by numerous gym owners over the weekend, all concerned about the closure of their gyms and the impact of their clients in terms of both physically and mentally. Do you share my view that gyms should be, be, should be kept open and with social distancing, strict social distancing guidelines for the perspective of mental health and physical health of people? And, Indulge me, please. Can you please also applaud the achievements of Calvin and Tipperary in their successes at the weekend? And it's extraordinary that they've won uh, an Ulster title the first in many years and a, a Munster title in the first in 85 years for Tipperary. And the extraordinary coincidence that the same four teams in the semi finals of the All Ireland as in 1920. 100 years on, it's bloody Sunday. So I totally agree. I watched the match yesterday and I thought it was. And I watched the match all over the weekend, even whether I wanted to or not, because it was blurring at every TV in the house uh, and every radio. So um, I have to congratulate them all. I think this has been historic. And it's almost 
uh, freaky, the way in which it's all happened. Um, I was just wondering when you talked to my son, because my son's a personal trainer, my youngest is a personal trainer. And um, so even in my home, I had one, and my family and my neighbours, you know, people saying, well, why is the gyms closing? And then people understand the restrictions. But at the end of the day, people have to earn their money. So I do think there needs to you know, be some approach even through um, uh, the Department for the Economy to go and try and, and get that. I also know that even um, in my own constituency in North Belfast, there's a walking club. Now, the walking club, they're two metres apart. It's like kids come from a nursery, but at least they're outside and they're trying to do a bit of exercise, they're trying to support each other. And I know some of those gym instructors are involved in those as well. But they literally are trying to do their best under very difficult circumstances. But I fully appreciate and fully understand a lot of them are losing income when the least needed. But the ones that I've spoken to also fully understand that they, they want to keep their, their clients and their customers safe and they want to keep them well. And I'm looking around the chamber and I dare suspect if the minister's son was to come up as a personal trainer, he'd do a roaring trade in the assembly. I call Mr. Allen Chambers. Thank you, uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, I, I welcome the Finance Minister's announcement today of an extra five million for charities to be administered by your department. Like most charities, the Royal British Legion has seen a drastic sh shortfall in donations compared to what they normally would have raised around this uh, time of year by the, uh, through the annual poppy appeal. Can I respectfully ask, will the Minister give a commitment that she will consider including the Royal British Legion in the scheme if they are not already included when she comes to distribute this extra money? Thank you. Well, I thank the member for his question. I'm not aware that they're not excluded, um, but certainly I will check on that. Uh, charities have had a horrendous time from March, an absolutely horrendous time, and a lot of the work and the purposes and the companionship and indeed the lifelines that those charities give to individuals is second to none. So I want to make sure they're supported as best possible. And again, uh, Conor Murphy has supported my additional bid for monies for charities under his announcement today. Mr Chambers. Thank you, I, thank you Minister. I'm sure I'm confident that uh, you will be fair in how you distribute that money. And I'm sure that all the local charities will have welcomed the news today. Thank you. Certainly, I hope, I do hope that the, the charities heard the news today. I also know that many of them know our officials and have been working with them. And I also know that the, the work that they're doing, not only during this year, but certainly getting into the new year, is really, really important. So I just want to give the member my commitment that regardless who the charity is, that they're respected, that they're valued. And I appreciate the work they're doing uh, with such little resource and investment, but to actually help so many. So I'm personally committed to make sure the charities get as much money as I can afford. Mr. Cathal Boylan. Last uh, Corner, and could I certainly add my congratulations to both Calvin and Tipperary as well. A great, great weekend for the GA. But could I ask the Minister just in relation to uh, personal independent payments of peas? How many of them are outstanding? Um, well, from memory, there, I mean, there's, there's, to be honest, Cathal, there are thousands and thousands. You know, that's unacceptable. Um, anything from five and a half to six, and even in response to a question from Daniel McCrossan earlier, it actually increases all the time. So, just to give the member assurances they have done with other members, it is my uh, commitment to try and get those appeals heard as soon as possible, and, and in a way and in a manner that actually helps people, helps the appellants, because uh, that's for me the concern I have, the stress that they're under. Uh, and not being able to have their pay heard in a way that suits him. Mr. Boylan. I'm all good. And could I thank the Minister for that? And just, I was going to ask the Minister what extra can she do actually to dispose of those, those great number of appeals? Well, I, like, God bless you, I will ensure, as I, I responded to Paul Free, that I'll go back and look again at opportunities to have these appeals heard if people want face, appeal, face appeals heard that it's done so as close to their constituency as possible. It's done with a maximum confidentiality and sensitivity. And at the end of the day, people feel that they've been given a fair here. And I think that's the most, one of the most frustrating things that I've heard from people who are waiting on appeals. Thank you, members. That concludes question time to the Minister for Communities. The next item on the agenda will be question time to the Minister for the Economy.
If members just take their ease for a moment, and if you're exiting the chamber, make sure you give the bench a wee scrub before you leave. Thank you.